Welcome to the 85th lecture of the Otara University of Commerce English Lecture Series. Today we welcome Professor Marianella Murata from Transylvania University of Russia in Romania. And her topic today is Teaching English to Romanian Learners, Trends, Challenges, and Opportunities. Please welcome Professor Marianella Murata. Seven, uh, and 17 postgraduate 
research area. So they, uh, we provide doctoral uh, training and doctoral tuition in 17 different areas, right? Um, and at the university level, again, globally, eight undergraduate and master's programs are taught fully in English. So we have uh, engineering, for instance, taught in English, or there was, uh, there is also a master's program in uh, electrical engineering that is taught in English, um, and so on and so forth. I think uh, mathematics and informatics also, I, I know that they also have a program for English, for English. Otherwise, English is taught as a second language. Uh, the knowledge areas covered at my university are by and large, engineering, business, forestry, mathematics, computer science, medicine, law, humanities, uh, that's the faculty of letters that I represent, arts, just the music faculty, um, sports, social sciences, and educational sciences, very general. Um, the university also has the ProDB Institute, the Research and Development Unit, completed in 2008. It is huge. This is just a view from the main hall. It's a, a very large unit with the laboratories for all the faculties to develop their research in. So it's uh, the university's property and it's uh, outside the city, somewhere in the university also has what is known as Aula Magna. It's the uh, university's library and conference hall. And this is where we hold our uh, conferences, uh, particularly the, the English uh, the Conference of British and American Studies. Okay, so. And we also have two campuses for our students. This is the, the image of one of them. Uh, and I'm talking about the white buildings here that are nearly in a circle. This is the uh, building with a green roof is the oldest part. It started from there, the uh, campus, and it, uh, it grew all around, as you can see. Um, these are the panels, solar panels. It's, uh, it's um, let's say, it's very trendy to have sustainable energy, and their students are implementing that, and our um, university uh, assists them and encourages them in that direction. Now, coming to the Faculty of Letters, this is one among the 18 different faculties. Uh, it was established as a separate entity in 2002, but we began as a satellite of the science faculty in 1991. That's when I joined the, the faculty. Uh, the number of students in 2000, and, uh, this academic year, we had 970. Um, the faculty uh, is organized in two different departments. One is called the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics, or DELTA, that's the department I'm managing. And there's another department of Literature and Cultural Studies, right? and other uh, colleagues are working in that department. Uh, the languages studied in our faculty are English, French, German, and that's common with Oh, and Spanish, sorry. Uh, these four languages are common for the entire university. Of course, at different levels, because the English taught at uh, students in languages is different for, from the English from the ESP to taught to engineers or medical students, for example. In uh, this coming academic year, we are also introducing a Chinese program. A pro okay. Come in. A Chinese program because our um, university has a Confucius Institute and uh, as part of the Confucius Institute you know after a while the agreement is that we implement a study program and uh, why not face it it's a real demand for Chinese um, 
our context. Um, overall, we have four undergraduate programs, two for each department, six master's programs, three for each department, and a doctoral school. That's all under the umbrella of our faculty. So this is what we want. Uh, Delta, my department, has, as I said, two undergraduate programs. One of them is called the Applied Modern English, uh, so Modern Languages, and the other one is English major. And those students majoring in English may have, may choose French, German, or Romanian as a minor language. Um, we used to have also Hungarian in the past, but we had to uh, close it down because there was no real demand for it, fewer and fewer students. Uh, we used to have Latin at some point, but it was not, uh, it was taught for, uh, uh, let's say, study purposes, not for teachers of uh, Latin or so. So it was, okay. And um, there are three ma uh, pro uh, master's programs that we run. One which is taught fully in English, and I'm coordinating this one, it is called Language Studies for Intercultural Communication. So uh, another master's is in French, it's a translation master's in French, and one is in Romanian, so one master's in English. We have at Delta, we have 25 staff members, 11 of them teach English, five French, four Romanian, three German, and two Spanish. Uh, the other department, the Department of Literature and Cultural Studies, has about 30, 30 uh, teachers. They also uh, teach these languages, but they are concerned with literature. Their subjects are literature and cultural studies. Okay, um, this is what we aim for. So this is the qualifications we provide to our students, to the students of the Faculty of Letters. They are they can become teachers or translators or interpreters, tour guides, public servants, like for instance, property officers, like that one, um, language consultants, intercultural mediators, research assistants, and researchers in the fields of humanities and social sciences. Researchers, of course, after they have completed their uh, doctoral program, right? they get their doctoral degree. Okay. Um, now, to be able to, coming to the point, I've come to the point now, to be able to give you a picture of what is actually going on, I think it's most useful to start with the contrast, what it used to be and what it is now. And I hope you won't think it's presumptuous to me, uh, of me to uh, say that this is a snapshot of what is going on in my university, because of, but as I told you, I've been there from the beginning. So I've seen things change more or less gradually under my eyes. So um, I have noticed a shift in, uh, in the attitude towards language learning the philosophy behind language teaching and in methodology. When I started out, the emphasis was on the grammar translation method, right? And it was uh, the kind of teaching that involved lockstep teaching, so everybody went on at the same time with a lot of drilling. Uh, I'm saying that in, a, in the most neutral and non-judgmental manner, so if I'm not passing judgment, this is better. This is different. And uh, so what we're doing now is a, a some, somewhat different because we had to adapt on the go. We've seen that the, uh, some methods were not uh, effective anymore and they had to uh, undergo some change. So in terms of, for, uh, I grouped everything according to some criteria. So for instance, if we considering purpose, what has changed from the beginning, from the 90s up to now, is the kind of English, the English used to be taught as a foreign language. Now it has become a second language. As a foreign language, as you may know, well, uh, you learned a foreign language, you were not expected to perform in it, right? It was a sign of a well-rounded education, so knowing the language, being able to speak the language. 
But after a while, it became imperative to know one language, and now, if you want to be a translator and you only know one language, you won't find jobs, at least in our companies. You have to know more than two languages, right? Two, at least two, at the very least two, if not more. So this is the shift that I'm talking about. From a foreign language, it was fully optional, now it has become a second language, and he, if, one, if someone wants to land a good job, a better paid job, uh, well, they have to know a foreign language, preferably English, which should be good for us because it keeps us in business. Um, in terms of uh, learning motivation, what was the motivation of our learners at first? It was a kind of subjective motivation because someone, a student, would choose a language according to the culture they most admired. Right, so, well, someone said once, I can't recall who, that we do not admire a language for what it is, we admire it for what has been done in it. So I think that's very true in our case, because first of all, someone picks a, chooses a language because they like the culture, they like something about the people, and they uh, would like to find out more about that culture. But slowly, slowly but surely, it became instrumental because, well, it's consistent with ESL. So you are expected to perform in that language. So we learn the language because we need to fulfill that some requirements. And you may need that language for social advancement or professional advancement. I remember that when I was I, in the 90s, right after the revolution, because in the 89, 90, there used to be uh, what we call the revolution. and. Uh, communist regime changed. And I became a protocol officer, and uh, I remember that, well, I needed to use a, a language. Before, I was only expected to be a teacher, but all of a sudden, I was, was expected to use that language for many more purposes, or different purposes. So, and I remember that I was paid 10% more for each language I spoke. So that should be a should be a motivation, right? Yes, ten percent. Um, the the focus of teaching has changed or has shifted from literacy to oracy because in the nineties students who came uh, had more developed uh, uh, writing and reading skills. This is what was done in class. And uh, there was a great deficit in terms of speaking and listening. So our students uh, were less proficient use, uh, le uh, speakers, language speakers, but they would be more proficient in terms of speaking. So uh, writing, for instance, was, in, in those days, writing was exclusively a support skill. Uh, because uh, students were asked and encouraged to write just to demonstrate their knowledge of other topics. If we do not have in the schedule, there's no such topic uh, as uh, uh, writing for social purposes. There is creative writing, but creative writing may promote other skills, but not social skills, right? So uh, you would see, for instance, in Britain, in the curricula, there's a discipline called writing, or with especially, especially designed to build up this uh, writing, social writing competence in people. But we did not have that, and uh, not much now. It, things are changes, but we do not have such a topic. But teachers are paying more and more attention to that. So it was used just to, for recitation of knowledge. That's the purpose it was used for writing. Um, reading also was subservient to Christian reading, right? Subservient to writing, so you read just to complete a writing task. Again, it was kind of different. So what we tried to do is was to build the confidence in our students, to get them to talk, right? Because some of them kept very silent in class. But when you assigned a writing task, they were uh, very articulate. And all of a sudden, there was a new face of them. So you discovered a person with their own mind, their own thoughts. And, but uh, just 
the way they behaved in class, you couldn't tell that. So we tried to overcome this, this balance by uh, focusing on oracy. In terms of methodology, as I said, in the beginning it was the grammar translation method and a more atomistic approach to language teaching and to language learning. So it was a focus on language knowledge, um, much to know about, about language rather than how to use language. Uh, so, uh, and a more decontextualized view of language. And most of the language learning and language teaching was done by drilling. So this is the rule, and now I'm going to give you exercises to apply that. Uh, we had to change, and we were kind of helped to change to uh, communicative method. So in the, I, I would say that the communicative method uh, came in, uh, or kicked in, in 93 or 94, when we had uh, gotten some uh, training from the British Council. So the British Council provided training not just to our university, uh, they picked uh, a number of universities from Romania, uh, universities around Romania, and they uh, tried to familiarize us with this. So it was, it provided a more holistic approach to language teaching and learning. It uh, focused on language skills, so not knowledge about language, but knowledge on how to use language. Uh, there's also an integration of language and culture, so it was no longer decontextualized, so language was uh, thought in conjunction with culture, there was a strong cultural component there, and it was a focus on learning by doing, by assigning tasks to students. Um, what was the standard of achievement? Uh, sorry, what was what meant mastery of language? So previously, mastery of language meant mastery of grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. And that was the standard of achievement. Later on, we uh, took as standard of achievement communicative competence. Is this a student communicatively competent? Uh, in the, the communicative competence paradigm, uh, linguistic competence is just one component. So we had to focus on the other three components of communicative competence, that is sociolinguistic competence, strategic competence, discourse, discursal competence. So all of these made a person communicatively com uh, competent. And I realized what, how important this shift was the hard way. So in 93, uh, I was, was on a scholarship uh, to Lancaster, and I was supposed to be a master in grammar. I was, I was teaching grammar to students. And when I got to Britain, I realized that people were making me say things twice. Can you imagine what a blow to my ego, to my professional <laughs> ego, right? I was supposed to be a specialist, and yet, the people whose language I was teaching didn't understand what I was talking about. And then I became aware that there was more to uh, mastery of the language, more than uh, uh, linguistic competence. You had to know not only how to say it, but when to say it, in according to the context and other things. So, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Can you explain what you mean by Social okay. Strategic yes, sure. Of course. Yes, I should have said it before. Sorry. Sorry for that. So we know what linguistic uh, or linguistic competence, right? Grammar, uh, vocabulary, and pronunciation. Okay. There are three more components, but uh, let, let me tell you that uh, according to some authors, this paradigm may use different uh, terminology. So you may. Okay. The sociolinguistic competence refers to the ability to say to use not only accurate language but appropriate language. Let me give you an example. So if someone, uh, I was queuing at the post office in Romania, and someone just in front of me said to the, the assistant there behind the counter, said, I want a stamp. I thought, wow, isn't that a bit direct? Isn't that a bit assertive? And I realized it was not 
that person's fault. It was mine because I was too used to the uh, English-speaking uh, culture where you would uh, make introduce such a request by, could I, by, would you, right, something like that. But in my culture, it's perfectly acceptable to say, I want a stamp. It's not disrespectful, so you see, it's, but it, I was, I had a foothold in two camps, in two cultures, you see, and I was kind of biased. But the first was, and then I realized, oh, it's perfectly acceptable. I mean, or I was given this example, the teachers that uh, trained us about it, it uh, examples of a student, German student, uh, mm -hmm. traveling abroad and there, his luggage got lost and he was reimbursed um, for the uh, lost baggage and he went to the shops in Britain and said uh, to the shop assistant, uh, show me those trousers, uh, give me that t-shirt. So the, the, the conclusion was, well, his language was perfectly correct because he could send the message across and people understood what he meant, but it was not. Right? That's sociolinguistics. Being able to choose from the language repertoire kind of language that is expected within that culture. Right? That, okay, so that um, strategic competence refers to the ability to initiate, to uh, redirect, to repair, and to terminate communication. So for instance, the ability to use fillers, to write it to, to all the, the, something that makes language sound natural, right? For instance, uh, if you, it happens to me sometimes when I'm in two minds of a, at a time. I, get, I went to, the, to a drugstore, and when I got in front of the counter, I forgot the name of the thing that I wanted to buy, right? the product I found. And then my strategic competence kicked in because I found ways to explain what I was looking for. So when students are at a loss for a word, they cannot remember that word. And for that, communication is broken. And this ability, this kind of competence, enables them to redirect communication, right? And to make them find ways to cope with this lo partial loss. It's a partial handle. This course community, I don't know if you remember how many times uh, our beginner learners, even inter the lower intermediates at uh, times, use this disruptive kind of language. So they kind of speak in sentences, one after another. This course of community, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this course competence refers to, a, to the ability to connect different parts of the discourse by means of meta-language, to signal the logical relationship between different parts of the message. And you know, this is very important because in our culture, meta-language is something, the use of meta-language, and developing the skills to employ the relevant to the meta-language is pretty much left to its own devices. So it has to take care of itself. So there are very little textbooks that actually uh, open the raise the uh, open the eye or raise the awareness of the learner as to the benefits, the ability to use mental language to make the message more accessible. Okay, so does that kind of sorry if I was too I but I just wanted to make sure. So what teaching aids were we using? Uh, conventional, I mean blackboard, and by conventional I mean blackboard and chalk. Uh, and other realia, realia, published like published mag materials, magazine books and textbooks. And in terms of equipment, we had cassette recorders, TV sets, and overhead projectors. That's what we used back in the 90s. Um, later, it came, we still uh, have not blackboards, but perhaps whiteboards, green <laughs> boards, you name them, every color. Yeah. Uh, okay. But there are still boards that we use uh, instead of chalk. We still use chalk. We still have that. Um, so uh, is, is that the vintage uh, teaching gate? <laughs> you see, that's why we're using them. Uh, and non-conventional. Non-conventional means like video.
video projectors, smart boards. We have smart boards, but I have to confess we, we don't use them that much. Standalone or network computers, uh, internet connection resources, right? So this, as you can see, there is more emphasis on technology, and technology does quite a lot in terms of, uh, at least for teaching, right? Because if I think of learning, very strange. In my times, in, in my time, we had so little, it was the communist regime, and we had so little means to improve, right, and to actually practice the language. And yet, we, uh, we were very, very uh, eager to learn the language, and we learned it better. Nowadays, students seem to have a lot of opening and facilities and opportunities to learn a language, and yet their language knowledge seems to be superficial. So that's, that's a paradox. That's a paradox. So they, they're all the time they're on the internet, they text messages, they are supposed to use language quite a lot, and yet uh, the accuracy of their language leaves very much to be desired, and they make a lot of mistakes. Okay, and to recap on what I have said so far, just to uh, give you an overview. So today, if I focus only what, on what happens today, we teach English at the university as a second language. Um, the motivation is clearly instrumental because uh, students learn a language to get a better job or to travel or to emigrate. Um, there is also a uh, focus from literacy to oracy and back because concentrating too much on oracy has again created a gap and this balance in terms of, uh, of uh, literacy, so writing and reading. And you know when I realized that? When our students became doctoral students and then they had to write very serious papers and we saw that well, they were very fluent when they presented their papers, but hey, uh, oral communication and oral presentation is less structured than a paper. So what you can do, if, well, I can say pretty much anything if you accept me, but if I were to put all this in writing, I would have to be very, very careful and to observe the, the, the norms associated with this genre. Like for instance, the uh, uh, research article, a genre in its own right. So, okay. um, so we had to move back and uh, redress again to literacy. So um, we kind of, for our students, students in letters, languages and literature, we had to divide, uh, for instance, writing for study purposes that was preparing the students to cope with academic tasks. So like essay writing, report writing, things that they would do while in school, as opposed to write a different strand of their writing abilities, uh, writing for social purposes. In other words, preparing the student to be a functional citizen in, in society. So to perform other writing tasks that go beyond their school life. And of course, there was, in terms of teaching and the teaching process, there was a focus on interaction between student to student or student to teacher. I don't know about your context, but in our context, when the teacher uh, addresses a student, everybody else thinks that they have a break and they kind of turn to each other and they, they don't listen. One problem with my people is that they do not listen to others. And then you have to say, hey, to shout, come on. This person may be asking a question that you are also interested in, right? And the risk is, okay, I've provided an answer to one student, and then another student asks, asks me something very similar, just because they didn't pay attention, right? So it's something that uh, student to student interaction is also very important. Then, the way in which they are supposed to interact, each, interact with each other, let's say, communicate, contradict, whatever they do, this is regulated, right? And it should be done at an academic level. 
bring. So um, this is in, was encouraged even in the form of lectures because uh, before uh, there was a teacher standing in front of a classroom and they were giving a lecture. Everybody would take down everything that was being said. Uh, no question, no comment. Uh, and sometimes the teacher wouldn't even check whether everything was understood. Uh, we have moved to something else. Now it's more interactive because we're using uh, the, the uh, uh, let's say, projectors, right? And uh, you know, the question with the PowerPoint is that it doesn't let you put much information on it. You just add one idea, sometimes just a phrase, not even a clause, an entire clause, and you take it from there and you develop that. But the downside of that is that our students think that all they should do is to write down what's on the slide, right? And if, if you speak, if you dictate something, if you read from a material, they would write. But the moment you put down the material and you speak to them freely, they think they should just look at you like this. What? And uh, in their first year of study, we have the study, we have to coach them and say, hey, this is for me. What you see on the slide is for me to keep me on track. It's not for you. Right? So just write the idea and write everything you need to know you feel you don't know around this. Right? So it's, it's big. If you leave it to their own choice, be sure that they come up with, and you get in the exam, you get that in the sentence. Well, it's easy. It's easy because that's your lecture. Very sad when you see this happen. So, by implementing everything that I have just said, we said, okay, problem solved, problem solved. But not really, because these solutions brought what we thought to be a solutions, patched up things on one side, but there were holes on the other side. So, they uh, engendered, they thought about further problems that we have to deal with. Okay. Uh, you may, as you may remember, the gist of communi the communicative method is to encourage learner autonomy. So for instance, uh, when reading a text, uh, the student is encouraged to glean the meaning from the larger context. And this has created, in time, because we didn't see that coming, a loss in a very important skill, the reference, a reference, the referencing skill. And that means the ability to look for relevant information, like for instance in a dictionary, the ability to check, to double check the information, right? To collect the information on their own. Right? This autonomy created some sort of superficial approach or a superficial attitude to language learning, right? And our student, this is important, it may be less important from students in other specialisms, but imagine a student in languages and literature who do not know a student who doesn't know the exact meaning of this and that word and that just guesses that this is the case. So, Unless we did a survey and we used, we had something like 290 respondents on the use of dictionary. We are also having the lexicography division and we are working on that. And we wanted to see how our students of different levels, undergraduate and graduate levels, use the dictionary. And they said, they, uh, for one thing, they didn't use uh, paper dictionaries very much. Paper dictionaries, I think, were very good because they allowed a student the opportunity to browse through that book. And they, you see, they had to go from one word to another. That's cross-referencing, as we know. And they picked up language without actually being aware of picking up a language. So I think it was a good uh, language learning opportunity, uh, of course, Times have changed, and most of our students use uh, online dictionaries, right? And not the best ones; they use the free ones, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of so. The, the loss of referencing skills ha 
has led to a superficial acquisition of knowledge. Where students um, trying to be auto autonomous, we co coach them to be autonomous, it meant that, well, they are less bound to be accurate about the words they're using. And they, well, it's guesswork. Language is guesswork, right? If you did wrong, guess again, right? You get a second chance. Um, other themes or other problems uh, lie with cultural and rhetorical discrepancies between Romanian and English. And this is very uh, interesting because I discovered them while teaching different groups of students. For instance, there is this notion of communicative responsibility that a scholar uh, a language analyst called Heinz, Heinz uh, put forward in the 80s when he studied contrastive under the umbrella of con contrastive rhetoric, uh, writing in Japan of Japanese students and uh, English language speaking students. And he came up with this concept of communicative responsibility. In other words, who is responsible for meaning making? Uh, my culture is predominantly uh, reader responsible. Sorry, yes, reader responsible. So, uh, so there's this division that Heinz suggested between uh, writer responsible cultures and reader responsible cultures. In a reader responsible culture, we may particularize that to a text. Sorry, I'm a bit rambling here, but we may speak about reader responsible writer of text. A person is reader responsible. That means that in that culture or with that individual, it is the reader's onus to make sense of the text. It's not the writer's job to facilitate the access to the message, it's the reader's job. And you know what that means? It means that the writer is less expected in that, in that culture, in a reader responsible culture, the writer is less expected to use meta language. Right? Meta language, as we know, right, signposting and connectors, they, they are the keys providing access to the text. In my culture, there is no induction program to teach people how to write and how to use meta language appropriately. So uh, that means that, well, it's uh, also, I ca uh, my culture is more tolerant to digression. And this again shows that the, there's less concern of how the reader will make sense of the text. Right? And one way I go about it when I uh, teach uh, the writing for, for research purposes to uh, student, doctoral students, I ask them uh, to take one of their own texts and to identify the macro structure, the stru stru structural organization behind that text. Okay, what are the units of your text? Where is the introduction? Where does it start? Where does it end? How do you signal the transition from one to the other? And I say, I tell them sometimes they have a hard time identifying their own structure. This tells me clearly that this they are reader responsible. They, these are samples of reader responsible texts. And I say, no, if you, the writer, cannot make sense of your text, cannot identify uh, the structure of your own text, how do you expect the reader to make sense of your text? Right? And then I, I create an awareness. I say, okay, if you choose to remain re uh, reader responsible, then at least you should do it in the know. So it's your own, uh, your own option, not because you didn't know any better. So that's the idea. On the other hand, writer responsible culture, the cultures, and these are the, the English speaking cultures, well, they teach uh, writing for it. Writing is taken here just as an example. Uh, they teach writing for its own sake, not as a subservient or for knowledge or display or uh, display to display knowledge. Uh, and they, of course, encourage uh, and in fact expect the reader to give, uh, sorry, the writer to give access, easy access to the writer by the use of the language. So in fact, it would be, let's say, academic poor manners not to use, to expect the reader to make more sense of the 
context or to put too much effort. Okay, and there's also something that we have to fight with, content over form. So there's virtually little concern uh, for the format of the text for paragraphing, for example, right? Or for the use of headlines. And they do not understand, in fact, in my time, there was this misconception that too much concern for the format um, is, uh, is a sign that you're trying to disguise some flaw, some conceptual flaw, right? So you're trying to put something in a nice package, but probably you do that because the content is weak. Again, I realized the importance of content. So it's not making a form all important, but it, you can, uh, we tried to show the student that form can promote the content does not hide, but disguise the content, it promotes the content. So if you have something good to sell, put it in a nice package, right? In a reader-friendly package. So let the reader see the structure of your paper by providing relevant headings, right? So that's the idea. And I learned it the hard way. I, in, uh, in 2000, uh, at the year, the year 2000, I was doing my the masters in education with Manchester University. So I sent the first chapter and was very proud that I got the first chapter right. And I got it back saying we didn't put it in the right format. Please go and read the information package we sent you. So it was kind of a shock that I got it back. So I put it in the format because I just sent uh, the text with no concern for the reader. It, I, I don't even think it, it got to my supervisor. No, it was just the office because I would send the paper to an office, they would open the package, it was done in the distance mode. And we would send by mail our papers. And I, they stopped me from the reception. So excuse me. Yes. So you're talking about readers. Who are these readers? Okay, the readers of the text. It depends. So for instance, so, if we write for academic purposes, mm -hmm. the reader may be a colleague, a peer, mm -hmm. or your supervisor, mm -hmm. PhD supervisor, or the panel you are pitching your PhD thesis to. Mm -hmm. Right? So these are, of course, what I can say is that these readers are specialists, and they have expectations. These expectations emerge from the uh, discipline-specific conventions associated with that, with that domain, right? But this is their professional responsibility. So they are expected to be with the, what you are writing or something. So they have to consider it on detail. You know, they have to read it fully and yeah. So if they just do a kind of, you know, uh, superficial level, Yes. So th that's not good. So, like, we are expected to read everything you have written. So, you need not make a format. You are not selling it to newspaper or something to attract people. This is your academic thing. So, yes, you're right. so, so you, you, do you mean that they should uh, just make sure that content is very important. important? So, showing your knowledge is very important. Yes. And so, that's making a format is shouldn't be uh, that important uh, as long as you are doing it for academic purposes. When you are doing it for newspaper or something else, so that should be taken into consideration that readers are involved. Anyway, sorry for the interruption. No, no it's, it's a good, a good yes. interruption. But you know, uh, the concern for uh, conventions mm -hmm. uh, is, let's say, something that we cannot ignore mm -hmm. because one of your papers might get rejected by a publication, specialist publication, just because you haven't met the expectations of the peers, of the members of the same discipline. Mm. Right? Yeah, 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 that's a practical reason. Yes, yeah, and in this way we are getting remote and remote from what, you know, uh, what education is for, my personal opinion. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay, so it's yes. fine. It's Sorry, sorry for yeah, you. Oh, well, please don't apologize. <laughs> no, I'm not apologizing. I'm, I'm, you know, don't say sorry for the interruption. I, I invited the interruption, and I'm glad. I'm glad because uh, it means that you 
listen to me, right? And you may have your that. own point of view, that's fine. Uh, you see, because not all the contexts are the same and not all the learners are the same. But what I'm trying to do is to cover all the bases. So as I said, if students choose to ignore this, mm -hmm. At least it's because they want to, not because they didn't know what to do, right? So they may have their own styles, but again, uh, Ford, as I said, Ford was looked down on, and I think it should be given the, not the primal place, but a sound place. Some state, yes. Yes, some state. Yes. They should be aware that this can be done better, can promote the content. Um, now, the question would be, can joint projects address local, because you see, I've presented a number of problems that might be local, or might be uh, seen local, in the sense that you might not have come across these situations. Some of them are common, I expect. Like, for instance, I saw today students uh, in a, uh, let's say, teaching um, or lecture hall, they're taking the back seats, not the front seats. And when I saw that at the university, I said, look, it's like our students. <laughs> so if you're in a large room, in a, a lecture theater, I right? see a lecture theater, and they're at the back there. And I say, hey, come down here. Join the living guys. <laughs> come here. So it's you have to kind of coast them. Give them candy, please sit here. No, usually I say I promise not to spit when I speak. So you can come here, don't be afraid, nothing is going to happen to you. Um, so some of the problems may be local, others may be global. And the question is, can joint international projects address local uh, educational problems? I, can, I think they can, So such as BLT, for example. I think they can. If not for anything else, but for the fact that they see that language learning and language use as a result of learning has actual application, right? When they are put in the position to discuss with peers, and there might be less pressure if those peers do not have English, do not speak English as a first language, because there might be a little bit of that's a reluctance when you address a native speaker, you students think that, well, they're being judged, they're being assessed. But if the language user, English language user, is a non-native uh, speaker, then perhaps uh, some of these constraints and some of this pressure is relieved. So uh, this is one thing, so showing why language learning is important. Uh, showing students today want to know why. Okay, I'm uh, I'm teaching a very abstract course, which I teach in Romania. It's uh, an introduction to theoretical linguistics. And this is something that they study uh, on the first semester, the first year of study, and they kind of abstract, and they are afraid, they are afraid of this class. I don't know why, because I'm, I'm playing the clown. I'm doing anything to get them closer to the topic. But it's because I, I can kind of guess why. Because they get very low results in the tests, in the final tests. And some of them uh, uh, fail the exam and have to come to resets and so on and so forth. It's not impossible. It's something uh, done uh, to help them. And I explain, look, you have to learn it. Why do I need this? Why? It's all theoretical. It's abstract. Look, you have to know about language, if not to explain others about language. So um, one of our Romanian linguists, Eugen, Eugenio Cochet, made the distinction between what is uh, the difference, the, between the difference be, uh, between a uh, linguist and a language a language user. They said, look, the language user has the skill. They may know many different languages and they use them. The linguist has the knowledge. So to be a linguist, you have to know about the language. 
first and foremost. And then to, many linguists learn the languages they describe, but they are not necessarily, this is not necessarily uh, compulsive, right? You can learn. So that's the difference between uh, a linguist and a polyglot. Outside, who kind of saw the opportunity. So, uh, I told my colleagues. 
is that when we had that meeting over Skype, uh, we were very surprised to see that not only those students involved in the task in the activities came, showed up, the group was full with students who had nothing to do with the, the activities, but they just wanted to see how it works, how it goes. <coughs> and they were uh, supportive of their colleagues who went in front of the microphone and said, uh, I'm so-and-so from team number two. I would like to ask <laughs> my colleagues about this and that. And you see, it was really uh, engaging. Let's thank our speaker first. Yeah. <laughs>